Uh, thank you very much. I wondered if you, what you have heard a lot of your work. But you know, uh, tobacco and uh, rice can be separated. The Philippines, of course, one follows the other. At any rate, why did they have to talk about rice? Because it is a special issue of the time. Rice became important to me when I was out of the government service. During the time I was with the government, I've always had a sack full of rice every month. No problem. Whether there is rice or not in the market, we always have it. Because the office that we, I was serving had a good relation, maybe good uh, credit with it. So anyway, it was in February uh, last two weeks when we have that uh, you know, price crisis. And uh, it sort of triggered my own interest to go into it. Why are we still having, you know, to import and why are not we producing enough? So let me start, well, rise and pay rice reserves. Outside it is right, written there is right, a rise and fall. Well, I choose pain, but what was written out was fall. Maybe whichever is right, but with this rise and fall, some heads will get a roll. So, let's take this rise and fall. Uh, not with my own words, but what expert Okay, that's better. I start with the words of the director uh, Alisaka when he said the rice is conundrum. Frankly, I did not understand what conundrum is. But as I read through, it does not sound well. But when I talk the meaning of conundrum, it really is a riddle. It means, conundrum means riddle. So if you substitute the word riddle for conundrum, then it will say the rice sector in the Philippines is a riddle. So it has now a better meaning. This is a riddle because it represents two greatest rice institute in the world. Now, then, another fellow, Rick Arbeck, said that since 1990, we were actually beginning to import rice. We became an importer from the marginal uh, producer of rice. So, we go to the next. And uh, the next official of the Rice Rising Council of the Rice Research, he did not fought on why. In fact, he lamented that shy about it. And he said, only we could produce rice as well as the Egyptians. Ten tons per hectare. And then in 2009, two local uh, experts, Coyne and Bernard, were commissioned to assess the impact of the field rice flagship program, Rice Check. This Rice Check, by the way, is an international program. But this is what they said, that price check lacks solid reserves, but both. It's happened by words, it's not theirs. So, okay. So it means really there is a reason to be, to feel that there is some kind of failure somewhere. Now, but let's not just leave uh, the, the locals to say what they say, but maybe we should hear what they Expats have to say, and here country says, Oh, we should break the 10 tons per hectare. Well, 10 tons per hectare is not our barrier, it is a barrier elsewhere, northern hemisphere. And then the government it blames the green revolution. Actually, the green revolution should the production upward to the point that it affected market. Uh, there's rapidly than the demand, and it slowed down the rice production since 1985. So that was their observation. And then, what did the economist recently come to Peter? He said, 
well, while food security, you know, the rice production is actually increasing. But the price doubled up. You know, it's, we, should, we should be expecting that as the production increases, that the price go down, but not in this case. Because the price is set due to the, the uh, when the demand is drawn out from the staff, means for the private human. And that's where the prices uh, grew up. Now, but maybe to far similar, the Director General of Erie, in fact, confessed that, oh, since the last 10 to 10 years, there was actually a decline in price yield. So there was a decline in price yield. So there must have been some kind of failure. Yeah. Uh, so why are we importing rice? You know, we are importing rice, but this is a big discussion. And open lots of promises that we will be stopping the importation of rice in the next two or three years. But how much do we really know about why we are importing rice? One of the reasons of importing rice is the mandate itself in this uh, quantitative restriction that the Philippines had to, you know, uh, an agreement with the GATT, the WTO, that can be explained later. And then, David Dawick, he said, in the book, Why Does Philippine Import Rice? He argued that we are importing rice because we are an island nation, devoid of, you know, uh, that we don't have the natural advantages of the river system in uh, Bingal Bay, if not the Thailand. Now, but the other, the economist, when he was studying this thing, he, he showed that we are now the largest customer for low quality rice, but a regular customer of a better quality American rice. So now I think these are two informations. That is for quite a low. And of course, we know that in two ways we really have a global rice crisis. So, oh, this is the 1995 guide, Uruguay, Uruguay Rad Agreement on Agriculture. We are a signatory, and it was from this aspect that we uh, choose quantitative restriction. And the meaning is right there. Maybe uh, other people can explain better this. So, <clears throat> When we went through the four statements of the uh, Filipino experts and the four statements coming from the international experts, visually, just looking at those statements, we can altogether say one very good, good, good conclusion. But out of the eighty statement, there was only one side. But if we digest what they were saying, it's really the assessment there are certain shortcomings and causes of research, activities at the and field rise that limited the social scientists, you know, to transform whatever research, uh, uh, technical <coughs> research, into uh, a technology that is self sufficient. Then, of course, I cannot speak for the social. Scientist, so I choose to start my search on the agroecological, agroecological aspects of rice research. If there is ever a reason to believe that such is also a major cause, so here I go. Well, that's just my little talent and the quest. You know, you are familiar with the quest of Don Quixote, and this is my quest, Don Adolfo. <laughs> so, so, I started my quest with a little philosophy. You have to self-entertain yourself before you can go forward. Then I said, oh, there must be nuggets of wisdom buried in all this stuff of information that has been gathering, you know, for the last year, so many years, so there must be a knowledge of wisdom burdened in tons and volumes of rice research. 
studies to be sifted as miners work in search for gold. But then, not, not all that glitter are gold. So many Natolian formations there are work for them. So my focus was on microbiological aspect. Now, in my search, I found on top of the, the national program developed by the, by the Philippines in response to the crisis of 2008. They call it the National Rice Program, which was bannered by the, uh, I think, Manila Bulletin as the 34.6 billion uh, program for rice. So in this case, they had two land use priorities. They were looking at irrigated and using certified and hybrid. Now, if you look at it, uh, you will know that hybrid seeds, certified seeds, there's a total of 1.5 billion, 3.9 billion, or 9 billion breeder seeds. There was a very big interest on in the use of hybrid seeds and certified seeds. And uh, if you are a businessman and you are looking for business to provide, as a miner would say, there, there is young gold, in, there is gold in then they are built. So, where can you find gold here? Well, so, hybrid rice, breeder, position of uh, supplies, mold, LCC, by the way. Oh, that's almost a billion. There's, there's money in there. Now, because of uh, the interest on hybrid seeds, I thought, is the Philippines ready to provide seeds? Are there available uh, hybrid seeds? And uh, at least I found that in fact hybrid seed was already developed as early as 1997 by Yiri. And then next is 1998 Monsanto. Now, it looks, this data looks good, right? The face value. But if you think a little, something is missing in here. What is missing, I suppose, here is where are the Philippines? Where is the, where, what is the role of the government in developing hybrid seed? I see Iri, I see Monsanto, but where is still rice? Where is IPB, where is UPLD? Why are they not interested in providing seeds? Hybrid seeds in that. And why, you know, every time you see this thing, when the first registrant is a multinational, you are almost giving up the birthright to providing the farmer cheaper because, you know, it's not cheap for them to register. So, uh, because I couldn't find, uh, I was interested that maybe there is some kind of a, an agreement between ERI and uh, multinational and other companies, you know, to do a joint uh, uh, program to produce hybrid seed. Now, I did not find any agreement between them. Philippines and Monsanto, for instance. And here, memorandum of agreement between ERI and partner institution as early as to five. What did I see? I see an agreement, Rice Week, where the Philippines is a participant. What the heck is Rice Week system in the Philippines? There's no such thing. Although, you know, I was the first graduate student here in the UPLB did work on my thesis, chemist thesis of Greek. But there is no such thing as a right wing system. And why is the Philippines a participant? I don't know. Next, sorbet farmers and consumers acceptance of 
Rise by Tech Prep. But this is only some participation here in the Philippines and the US. Not any Southeast Asia either. No, is it a participator? Or is it participant? Biotech? Gene more rights? Oh, the Japan. Japanese Indians get rid of it. Here are the Philippines. Instead of using rights, here are the rights. And what I would like to point out here is the program. Uh, developing a system to apprentice by post harvest technology, although the Philippines is not an interested party. Integrated rice research consortium. The Philippines is only interested in labor, productivity. They are not interested about doing activity on post harvest and uh, fertilizer management. So, this is the kind of thing that we have been doing. Now, this is I'm sure it contributes uh, somehow, but maybe it should be being more focused. We should be focused on our needs. Um, that's why I'm here. Maybe to remind you not the old ones like me, maybe the young ones like you. Now, this is the fertilizer. This is the management that goes with the national program. And you can see that. Ah, it's very simplistic. While well, others have developed a uh, more specific management here. Well, and anyway, the problem rise and solves. Are we responding to it? This is the problem solved in the Philippines. That's uh, determined early in 1973. So, but, you know. Let's take a look at the earlier uh, years of rice for these areas. In the early years, of course, we uh, were doing already rice in the Philippines. Uh, but let us not just say that theory is not necessary, but in fact, if you look at the early years of the area, its vision was to break the green yield barrier and raise the level of new yield in the tropics, of the Philippines, but Southeast Asia. And in the recruitment of every scientist, we had a certain kind of philosophy. Not really standard. But here, they said that promising young scientists to stay to make a name for themselves rather than mature and renowned persons who might tend to rest on their laurels. This was their starting point. Then, of course, you had the design concept of how to improve rice. And, of course, they had their major accomplishment. It's the word that only the Philippines is really, you know, uh, is attributed to it during this period. Now, we compare the establishment of field rice. 1956, their main recruit, they did not start from the bottom, but they start with the best. And that's a good option. But I don't know how many of these people really contributed their good everything. So, so what is the strength now? Well, consider there are more breeders and breeding, there are 10 PhDs, agronomy and soil values, crop protection, uh, so on and so forth. So, this is the strength. Is that, is this a weak uh, and power? I don't think so. Yeah. If we review, you know, the past 50 years, the 60s, there was, the 60s, that was when the, the yield barrier was broken. And then in the 80s, there was a decline and in stagnation. By the 90s, there was again an improvement. And sometimes, I don't know why. But each of them have reason for that. You would say that, let's say, the, how the, in the 60s, how the yield was broken, it was because of the development of a certain prototype of rice. And then, again, because of the 
launched the first green revolution. And this is the, the, uh, the cause was, well, they think that the shift in donors' emphasis to environmental uh, conservation and sustainable agriculture. They were getting away, we were trying to save the world. Uh, and uh, somehow, I think the, the impetus for increasing yield uh, was I like. So, we look at this. This is the. So, in the early 60s, there was this rise in uh, here. These are the potential higher yield increase. There was an increase in here. But beyond the ages, the search for higher was substituted for lower. And the said this is due to the shift in the dollar synthesis. There was a shift in dollar synthesis. And right now there's again a shift to upward. And this is due to what you are saying second revolution, green revolution. And their program is by redesigning another plant, the new plant type. Now, you see, there was, the, this is the status of production for the okay. uh, You will know that this really increased. We have done well in the area our average Yield have now increased from 1.2 to 3.7. Many farmers are now growing more rice and more land. So that our production have increased from 3 to 13. And, you know, sometimes this, uh, this confuses me, this particular argument here, that we fear that there are no more land for improving rice. But I don't know why there is an increased trend. Crop area. Yeah. So this is area. It did not say crop. That is crop area because our fiscal area is only 2.7. Yeah, yeah. So it refers to the uh, 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 second uh, crop. Well, maybe. But let me see. Anyway. There are always many contentions that the Philippines is a low yielder. Ah, this is the problem with the, this thing. We have this learning here using uh, PowerPoint. I thought I had this and properly already. But let's say in the Philippines, the production is 14, <laughs> the yield is 3.47, Indonesia is 4.7. Vietnam 4.8, Myanmar 3.61, all the others are in the neighborhood of 6, 9, so and so forth. Now, I think we should emphasize here that uh, our low yield is a uh, natural limitation for our yield because we are limited because of our latitude, uh, where our sun hours is limited, where the temperature is higher, but let's say Vietnam. Vietnam has a latitude ranging from 8 to 27 to the northern portion of that is subtropical already. Myanmar is in also. So some of the good yield of Myanmar comes from the northern subtropical. Brazil is very much like us, no blue yield. But China, you know, 18 to 54, they have to have a wide range for some of the colder areas. So, Egypt, how about Egypt? Uh, this is where the research also was lamenting why we could have produced as well. But because they also have a higher northern latitude, 22 to 32. This is more favorable. Hmm. Now, I thought of, you know, uh, putting together what I thought are the agroecological uh, basis and there are many lot of discussions about Yelka. Social economists have uh, reviewed some research for Yelka, but if you break it down, that is not the yield. 
By the way, let's say this one is the highest yield that we can get from tropical Asia, and this is our average yield. We compare it to the highest among tropical Asia. Then we have a graph. We compare ourselves to the subtropical Asia we have been given in by the graph. And we compare ourselves with the northern sub temperature. Well, we even have a wider gap of 5 to 7. But even in our case here in the Philippines, the dry season and the wet season, there's a marked difference here. Latitude also from the south, there's also some differences. Now, how do you get this data? You, get the, you know, you, you go through some of these regional data and try to get the highest the average. So, now these are some of the problems solved. We do not have to go through this, but I guess uh, by going through this, we can come up with an integrated, you know, point. We really have to go point by point. But what I would like to emphasize here that the yield gaps due to effects of differences in geographical, agroecological environment should be emphasized to policymakers and politicians as natural indications to achieve a yield. Now, in this case here, you know, when a politician goes to China, the first thing he did was to lambast the ability to be for not doing enough, while all of them there are wallowing in our yield. We are not. He said, we are not, no, you know, we are not doing our best. He would compare us to Vietnam, naturally. We are much lower in potential yield. Now, I think, this is one thing that should be emphasized as the dry science in some of our leaders in research. But, you know, we have to explain. There is a reason we have our own limitations. So, now, this one here, yeah, the current view of dry science would lead to the new plant type. A higher green yield associated more with increased biological yield. To me, this is okay, I accept this one. But the, the uh, implication of this is that if we go through the NPT, uh, let's say that we in the Philippines moved along this line, you know, it's an uphill battle for us. But whatever is good about this NPT, most likely will favor the northern hemisphere. I have reason for that. I'm sure if someone will ask, I may have some explanation. <coughs> so, I think I said about this thing that, you know, the international program, ERI, Interise, Importing, Important Exporting Countries, they have emphasized intensive research work uh, designed for integrated and holistic approach to rice production technology. We are not doing this. So, if you happen to take note of these two wonderful books, Linquest, you will know that they really have classified their countries into production of these These places defined for soil, water, climate, and tension. In Thailand, when I was there to present something about energy, they have actually classify the whole country into different grids, grid, G-R-I-D, uh, how much each of these places, or how much solar energy it will receive, uh, including the effects of mountain uh, hmm. Now, again, Indonesia and other, Indonesia was Besides a nutrient formulation management, we, I think we see that in the program that we are having with URI. Now, I think in my, this is just my feeling, and I hope people agree or disagree with me. But I think we are putting more emphasis on breeding. Now, if you look at the breeding, uh, aspects of their performance, even a theory. If you review all the, the varieties that I 
has been released by UAE since 1960s, you will know that the number of varieties that they release in one or two years is about only one or two per year. And the most number they have released in 1998, I guess, was four. I mean, all those thousands of lines that they go through, they can only release one or two every year. So it's an efficient approach to improving. Maybe that has to be evaluated also. Because there are other uh, yield limiting aspects in crop production. Uh, now, this one here, research highlight intended for donor satisfaction. I think this is really research information management. And uh, some of you may have, uh, we will marry this research highlights intended for donor satisfaction. It's of little value for consolidating data for information. Until such results are published in technical bulletins. Now, if they are published in technical bulletins, Elsevier or even Grounded Journal, now, if you are interested to use some of this data, you know, there's some kind of fear because there's always this here, all rights reserved. No data in any form can be used for whatever unless the publisher gives you the permission. Uh, yeah. You think there are so many of these things, but Available. Now, this research highlights, you know, oftentimes you just give a summary, the highlights of this, not really giving out the methodology, so much so forth. Here he was doing that, the whole report, you can almost follow it through until, I think, before 2000. 2000, he just gave highlights. Highlights, you know, whether it is eerie, pillarized also is another thing, giving highlights. When you read highlights, yes. Sometimes I would say, you know, when you research highlights, it's easier to do that. But if you are a researcher following, trying to follow, you know, what you get are lots of promises, little to say. Chase the problem in the area of increasing, trying to increase yield. But we did not know that our food consumption has been increasing like this. Before, we were only consuming 99 kilos per year per person. It has increased now. The latest estimate is 120. We're trying to, uh, you know, to say that one of the major problems is increasing population. Well, I think we also forget that we are also increasing our consumption, even higher. Maybe. So, who is? Where are we going? I say that the current international commitment to price research and mostly beyond the Philippine education. I wish someone of you will ask me, because if you will ask me, then you believe it. The other one is that it may be well for the Philippines to look more inward. What it needs, other than being an ecological niche of research interest. So, oh, anyway. I would like to end my presentation here. Some other slides have been open with there. It is some logical answer. So, I okay. Let's give uh, Dr. Jesus a round of applause. Thank you, sir. 
Uh, the floor is now open for your questions or your comments on Dr. Nisisito's presentation on the rise and fail of rice production, rice research and development on production technology in the Philippines. Any questions or comments from the audience? Please use the microphones around the room. Introduce yourself and your organization, please. Any questions, comments? Yes, sir? Sir, it's a promise that uh, my class will be here. <laughs> so we're here and we have a line of and it's at the Galing Mohammed Sapil, so we rush up. So just on time, nick of time, we're here. Thank you. Dr. Pamela is here also. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a huge challenge uh, to address <laughs> this uh, concern on whether we can do sufficient rice, uh, especially with this. Uh, uh, climate change uh, concern. You know? uh, if uh, this global warming will continue and those uh, Greenland ice sheets that ice will all melt or those snow in the Himalayas that supply the water downstream in where we are importing rice. So we don't know <laughs> what will happen. Uh, Perhaps it will not happen in our lifetime, but uh, uh, or, uh, hopefully not, but uh, still it's something that we should uh, take note. But of course, the uh, pinakamalapit na threat uh, will be the oil price, because our rice production is so oil dependent. In our class, we have estimated the uh, amount of liter diesel oil equivalent uh, to grow and serve rice on the table, it, it's amount to uh, something like 830 liter diesel oil equivalent. 50% of that comes in the form of nitrogen, because nitrogen consumed when it reaches the Philippines is about 2.15 liter diesel oil equivalent per kilogram. Uh, so right now, our emphasis in growing rice is to use chemical fertilizer. And when we say chemical fertilizer, it's 80% nitrogen. So again, it's something that uh, rice researchers should be worried about, should uh, think about how we can delink or dissociate yield to nitrogen. Is that your question? Uh, Hold the question any moment. <laughs> well, you know, I think uh, it was last week there were three Supposedly, I don't know if they were lobbyists on climate change. There were three speakers here, one was from the USDA, NASA, and uh, I posed a question to them. I tend to emphasize about ice cap and ice. But what is the role? We are there in desert. A desert in Cesare, or a to survive. Why are we looking at the already populated area for building up our carbon crop? Why not utilize all this, you know, we may have the technology for it, why not vegetate all these deserts and see? But the argument here really is that the earth does self mitigate each other. One part of the world is very cold, another area gets warm. Anyway, even uh, you know, nitrogen. Nitrogen in petroleum that is naphtha. Naphtha is a byproduct of oil exploration and refining. In 1940 or earlier, NAFTA was almost without any value. You know, no cost at all, it was a waste. But it was a good source, somebody was able to develop how to utilize it to become a fertilizer. And a history, the one that I was reading is that Russia and Japan went right into it and made went into the manufacture. 
So, that was in the early 60s and 70s. The world was able to build up its food security. And then, you know, the world, food security increases the price of that. But, you know, sometimes we would say with the price of uh, LPG now going up, the price of gasoline going up. What the hell are we trying to support a greedy nation? If I were to, maybe, if you want to discourage the use of more fuel, charcoal, why not subsidize LPG? If you can subsidize LPG to 10 pesos per kilo, would you still cut your trees? No. But they are subsidizing their greed. Nitrogen is the most available element in the world, 78%. In the atmosphere, 21% is oxygen. Carbon dioxide is only 0.003%. Yet we worry about it. Well, just for the sake of argument, if you are going to bring down nitrogen concentration in the atmosphere from 78 to 50 and try you know, to grab the nitrogen up, just like what you want to do for carbon, you know, track it. Do you think the world will be colder? It will even be hotter. We will all die because Ammonia is the most efficient hole of the atmosphere. Carbon, by reflection, little absorption, but the greatest pollen is ammonia, and of course, water. Now, I know that there is a good discussion about organic matter, and I do believe but we allow also the all this nitrogen to go out and abuse. I don't know. Um, next there is a discussion. I do not wish to uh, make an argument out of the use of organic because there is a purpose for that right now. But you ask me. If I use organic fertilizer for the food security, they say, might not support it. So then there is no money as far as you know, the profit for the farmer is very small. Low yield. But if you look at how much money the government can have under the carbon trade, Maybe there is money. If the country goes into carbon trade, and the, the world would say, okay, you plant this, capture as much carbon, we pay it. How much will we'll go to the farm Yes. Uh, any more questions or comments from the audience? If you wish to look uh, more closely, there's a question. Yes, ma'am. If you wish to look more closely at Dr. Nisito's PowerPoint presentation, we will be uploading it in the Circa ATSS website later this week. So, uh, Pam Fernandez from Agronomy. Uh, the, the issue of rice consumption is an interesting one. People now who are into brown rice know that um, when you eat, used to eat two cups of uh, white rice, you only eat one cup or less. So I think that's one thing in, in lifestyle. You know, we can look at production system, but we can also look at lifestyle. That you know, they're, they really you could really lower the demand for for rice by eating the more nutritious brown or unpolished. One. 
and the other is uh, it can be also that we are eating less root crops. If you eat root crops, you har you plant, you harvest, you wash, you cook. You rice, you do so many things besides that. And you transport it. And you have to store it more, uh, more carefully. So again, what what should we eat that is related to the production side? Okay. And also the in the cultural side or cultural management side, you can also look at uh, other production systems. I mean, I, I agree that you know breeding is important, but I think there are other solutions, solutions other than breeding that also cost less in terms of investment and hiring people, breeders, and whatever. And you can look at the real nature of rice. Rice is not really a water plant, but a sun plant, and meaning you, you should put more air into the soil than, than you know, restrict the oxygen there. So that you can have your 10 uh, tons per hectare, 15 and even 20 tons per hectare, but just cultural management practice. You can look at system of rice intensification. There are other, other things we can look at in terms of uh, the rice issue. And I think uh, very interesting ones would dwell in the in the, the realm of uh, lifestyle. We can change lifestyle, change our price demand, our uh, price needs. Yeah, thank you for that. But again, we're looking at brown rice. Meaning, brown rice meaning you don't remove as much with the grains. Let it stay. So if you move, the us say the brown, you know, the, what do you call that, skin over the grain, if that is two or three percent of the grain weight, then just by allowing us to, you know, we are, we are able to enough to eat this time, then actually our supply would be increased by two to three percent, which we consider as a waste in our present way of milling. Yeah. Uh, I was sort of smiling when you said, why don't we eat more root crops? And I was teaching a course here, environmental ecology and physiology, written in the undergrad. I asked a student, what do you think that you, you plant? Do you think by planting root crops, you can increase rice yield. And I said, if we plant root crops, you can increase the yeah, rice yield. Is there anyone who can answer here? Anyway. <laughs> I said, yes, yeah, no, you can do that. He said, how so? Well, of course, when you plant root crops, it's a kamote, and we get kamote, and you improve, increase the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air, which is a form of carbon dioxide fertilization, which we know will increase the That's one. But uh, yeah, why not? In some area, you know, they were able to reduce price consumption by more alternative food products. Some of them can. Others in more food preparation and one Chinese spring, I don't know if he was kidding, he said during a certain dynasty, China was into a famine, widespread famine. So the emperor gathered all the cooks and asked them, produce as many types of food preparation from a single pen. What I give And they were able to produce as many. And one if they thought you will be able to develop, let's say, ten different kinds of preparation. That's one. But back to to this I wish really, you know, as I went through all my review and rice this kids here, I found that there is some kind of uh, 
deficiency in our understanding of rice. I think we need to understand and form, put more effort on rice science. This thing here, you know, when I say about NPT, that it will favor more the northern hemisphere, it's not just a, it's not just a big geologic, but it is really intrusive. But we fail to recognize this because we fail to emphasize rice as a science. If you look at it as a science, we know that yeah, we can do it. Okay, you plant time. You know, look at that. I agree with you. This is the current emphasis. You go and talk to dairy people, talk to bank. You will be able to understand if you have the same language with them, you will be able to discuss with them. And uh, this is my take. We have been changing, we follow this badly. But, uh, you know, this is a good example. I thought this for your own, you know, this is something that, if you compare, let's say here, this is China and the Philippines. If you look at the zero, zero fertilizer, Chinese variety and then the Philippine cultivar ones do. And look at the particle per square. We are opposed to each other, right? You see that the Philippines, there are more particles per square meter. And it improves with increasing fertilizer. The same is true with China, but the Chinese variety are low The Philippines somehow Item. And then it goes into a spike per particle. China 136. It means they have a bigger particle. 136 to 92. In fact, they have. Unfortunately, this new plant type was defined was a description of a Chinese variety. The Filipino scientist not sensitive enough to see the difference because we never think of rice as a science. <coughs> so, if we, I have actually asked this question uh, because the importance of even if you use the polar chart when you have a different determinant of yield then you will have a different interpretation. So, you know, this case here really summarizes, I hope the students here will know. This is a long study. It involved initially 57 new entries. Then, they tried to improve that 1998 and tried to make sense out of it, to understand it. And you know the same thing. What you see between China and the Philippines, if they are out here. And what you see if they are planted in the same area, you will see that IR72 particles for 69 NPT, smaller, smaller. So these are trends. I wish I could stay well. This is our decade. I always say that. I'm now 70. And this is my decade. Any of us will end up decade, you know, it will be living too. But I hope you can share a little knowledge because I do, you know, something different to the students. Philippine students really. They don't ask questions. They don't think to believe that we're asking questions is a 
skinny thorax, exposing your thorax. And, but not bragging. But I had a chance to teach at Cornell that, you know, as a system, as handling laboratory. Yeah, two semesters, it means I was not doing it. But otherwise, I got only for one semester. But the difference is, they will ask, when you know that they knew, you're asking if I knew. Or what they knew is right. So, with that, unless I get another. Are there any more questions from the audience? We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for that uh, very nice uh, presentation. I would like to contribute a little. Uh, I am a forester, and for 11 years that I was in the logging industry, for uh, several years that we did forest inventory in the provinces of Agusan Norte, Agusan Sur, Misamis Oriental, and Bukidno. Sometimes there is no rice. There is only corn, kamote, cassava, and banana. And the good thing with this, you don't have to eat three times a day. Yes. And two meriendas. You eat probably only twice. Uh, sometimes in the morning and sometimes in the evening. And well, we, 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 after some time, we, we got accustomed to eating this in the in our in our uh, uh, what in our daily life, and we feel we were stronger. That's why instead of staying there all the time, sometimes I go home and have a romance with my wife because. I feel I'm strong, very strong. <laughs> so I suggest that uh, uh, also a little attention, especially on the highlands, in the production of this alternative foods like the uh, good lady said, the uh, cassava, kamote, banana, uh, and uh, whatever, uh, probably gabi. Uh, these are, uh, well, uh, the uplands are not for rice production, uh, they, but they are uh, all right for these uh, food crops. So uh, I suggest a little research and development system uh, uh, attention should be given to these alternative crops and use the uplands because the uplands, uh, well, they are now uh, vacant. Everybody does not like to live uh, to what develop the uplands. Why can we not develop these uplands for these alternative foods and do not depend entirely on rice? Thank you very much. Yes, yes. In fact, that's right. Uh, well, I come from the Visayas. I know how to eat pork. In the area, the method of uh, milling corn was not as good yet, the <laughs> They would call it the Later on, they were able to develop the way. But, yeah, why not? Of course, there are limitations. A plan. In fact, if I would go into that kind of problem soils, they would say the upland, you know, if you look at the statistics of the rise yield in the upland across many, many shows, it's always the lowest. It's even lower than the, the, the flat from the area. The average would be 1.5 and the upland is 1. Except in Korea. But the upland tends to be higher. Uh, at any rate, yes, why not? You know, in the early years of uh, the Korean Revolution, uh, they were pushing for the upland. In fact, in in Abra, oh, there were almost, there were areas that they were bulldozing for, you know, for 
programs for RISE. But then, in the end, uh, we meet the farmer, a very progressive farmer, the most, most likely in that area, in that town of Vision, in Well, he has a granary, it's a rosary, a bill of arms, and he has I was then with the engineer Andales, who's the now is uh, the husband <coughs> post harvest. But you asked the farmer, because he was growing this tall varieties of rice. And he has about three or four carabouts. He said, why don't you shift to you know this new variety from Iri that are short? Because there the bread was really growing. He said, then the old man, oh, okay. thought about it. And he said, so if I get higher, then what? What should I do? You can, well, you know, okay, if I get more yet, I will have to build another granary. Then you sell it. And he told us, you know, young men, you are young. Do you know how much it cost us to, to bring one sack to Palai from here to Banget? Banget then was in the area of uh, Silofi, the religious statue. Uh, you know, it cost us twice my fare for one sack. No, I don't need. No, I don't need another granite. And these are some philosophy. Maybe you have taken a little for granted. You have a sustainable way of life. And so, oh, there are many good things in the beer plant. We think to think that they are not ahead of us. They are ahead of us in organic matter, conservation and management. I thought I knew. But then the shoe was, you know, along the river bed. There were cartloads of compost. They would spread it, spread it along the river where they can plant sometimes vegetables, but prepare the center. No, I think what? we should be looking at this thing. No. Things that causes the chain to get broken. 
requirements. And you give up the birth right for the great seats. Oh, there are lots of that. And I'm glad that you could spend my time in Christ. Imagine where a centimeter square of rice that grows in a restaurant. Where you find the rice that wins. Think of it. Just be grateful for getting your coffee. Because out of that, you can get 100. You know, try to compute this one. You will really get the hat. What if all but have all plant bears in particular rice for any you know, the place? We did not be green together for the time. And then last that's all. But then, what if, and if, but then, we thought to have rows of 10 square meters square of that to house 500 pounds of rice in the way. Not for the 5 or 10 tons of rice. What is scornful? I can't proceed. I'm green again. 